Ice the Cream of a Lord, Fanny Vanella. Welcome back to another exciting edition of Gundam Death Breakdown. Today we're going to look into a death that may seem a little small in the grand scheme of things, but in my continuing journey to cover every single death in Gundam, we've got to talk about this one. Yes, I'm still sticking with the Universal Century. I promise one of these days I'll jump into an AU death again. Comment down below of which AU death you want to see. Anyway, so today we'll be a dive into the brief appearance and death of Xeon's greatest supply captain, Gano. I say brief because he only appears in this one episode, but this guy has an accolade that not even Char has in Gundam history. So let's break it down. Three, two, one. So, Gotham, no age or last name given, was a captain of the Principality of Xeon. Originally, not much was known about him outside of him being a supply captain in Xeon's supply corps. But thanks to some supplemental material, some more background information has been flushed out. Okay, so whether or not it's canon is up for debate. But for the sake of this video, I'm going with it as being canon. Before the One Year War, Gotham was a part of the Mobile Suit Training Battalion. Before Char was renowned as the infamous Red Comet for his exploits during the Battle of Loom, Gotham was a part of the very first battle involving mobile suits in Universal Century 0077. That means Gotham is a part of mobile suit history. Now granted, not a single shot was fired and the Federation soldiers were quick to surrender to gigantic gun-wielding mechas. A conflict is a conflict. Gotham is a man of duty, driven by not only loyalty to his country, but to the promise of a fallen comrade. He swears that he will deliver the mobile suits that his friend tried so hard in developing. If you want to read more about Gotham's entire backstory, check out Gundam Legacy. It's full of amazing background stories involving Universal Century. Fast forward to Universal Century 0079, The One Year War. After Shar's failure at Side 7, you know, losing four Zakus, firing all of his ship's missiles and ammunition, and ruining Dozo's celebratory party for Shard's triumph? We were all set last night to celebrate the successful completion of your mission, but I never expected you to be a no-show for a party where you were the intended guest of honor. Shar asked Dozo for more supplies and Zakus, and even though it was granted, Shar is disappointed that it's being delivered in a Papua-class ship. And instead of three Zakus, he's only getting two. The Papua-class ship, this strange upside-down-looking supply ship, was the pack mule for Xeon's navy. It could carry a total of 24 Zakus on a full load. So naturally, with it carrying only two Zakus, you can imagine Shar's disappointment. It has a number of anti-mobile suit armaments, but it is defenseless against battleships. At the time of this episode, it was already outclassed by the strange Pazak-class transport, which carries a whooping 60 mobile suits. So again, Char being pissed about a Papua-class ship is like asking your friend to help move out of a house, but instead of bringing his Ford F-150, he ends up bringing a K-truck. Then again, I doubt he would be complaining if the Papua brought a full load of Zakus. Also, an interesting note here, we see Xeon's first struggle in the war. Keeping this war up is an expensive and resource-draining process, and those are limits that they are having trouble keeping up with demand. Sad truth is, we don't have the resources we had in the past. This only furthers the importance of Xeon's foothold on Earth, including the leadership of Garma Zabi and Makuve in Odessa. You could say that this is already the first sign of Xeon's demise. Later on, the Papua pulls up next to Shars Musai and communication is established. Open a video link. Sir. I can't figure out why the Red Comet would be in such desperate need of supplies this quickly. Got him. The enemy's very close. We've got to hurry. See how Char is acting? Yeah, in this episode, he is really feeling the heat. Normally, he's cool-headed and calculating, but there is a sense of urgency and panic. After all, the Federation now has mobile suits. The one thing that kept Zian on top of this war. Gotham is borderline offended at Char's tone. Just because he's old doesn't mean he isn't aware of the situation. Now, you might be wondering how in the world would they transfer all of these supplies from ship to ship in space? Well, there's a neat little conveyor pipe that connects the two. But just as the process is being started, the White Base has already launched the Core Fighter and the Gundam, a preemptive strike, something Char wasn't even expecting. 
Hey, Shar, what was it that you just said in the last episode? In war, to keep the upper hand, you have to think two or three moves ahead of the enemy. Thanks to Amuro's quick thinking, he and Ryu will attack with the sun behind them. That way, the Xeon forces wouldn't know what hit them. Gotham is aware of a Federation base on the other side of Luna, too. But warn Shar that due to Minofsky interference, there might be a ship nearby. Even though Shar thinks it's possible, he doesn't do anything about it. But who's to blame him? He's in no position to launch any sort of countermeasure. Then again, who leaves their ship so vulnerable out in the open? Either way, this is a fatal mistake on Zeon's side. Amuro, with the sun to his back, had a wide open shot at both the Papua and the Musai. The Gundam fires its bazooka and scores a direct hit on the conveyor pipe. Just a few seconds ago, we saw this poor Zeon soldier at the center. It's safe to say that he got absolutely vaporized. With the pipe destroyed, Gotham orders the Papua to retreat. But as the ship tries to evade, another bazooka shot is fired. Char demands for Gotham to release the Zakus from the Papua. This right here is Gotham's moment. After all, he did swear to his dead friend that he would deliver these weapons no matter what. Despite his ship getting blasted by the Gundam, he orders his men to deliver those Zakus and all of the supplies. As Shar launches to deal with the Gundam, Dren is moving the Musai to cover the Papua. Remember, due to Minovsky interference, guided weapons don't work, so all the Musai can do is aimlessly fire its missiles towards the sun. As for the ship's mega particle cannons, it'll take five minutes to charge, so that's not an option in the heat of battle. Just then, another shot was fired, and a sparksman Shar Azenable, the Red Comet, Missed. Four, three, that is too close. Two. The shot hits the Papua in the rear. Ryu's core fighter takes on the lightly armored Papua. Even its 25mm Vulcan cannons are able to penetrate. With escape nearly impossible, Gotham orders the Papua to descend and drop the supplies on Luna 2's surface. Just then, the white base emerges over the horizon and begins to attack. Gotham's men are seen manually pushing giant crates amidst the hail of beam shots and bullets. Just imagine how frightening this would be. However, a blunder occurs on Ryu's part. Because he's swooping around and firing, White Beast can't get a clear shot without accidentally putting him in a crossfire. You would think a soldier would know better, but here we are. After Shard delivers the infamous Shark Kick, <laughs> Dren reports that the ship is unable to use its mega particle cannons. Char blames the aged Papua for not transferring the Zakus yet, but its catapult was damaged during the assault. Even still, Char doesn't care. He wants those Zakus, even if it's all they could get from the Papua. Meanwhile, Gotham is doing just that. He's trying to galvanize his men to get those supplies out of the ship, including manually cranking the Zakus out of the hangar. But just as he gains a little momentum with his men, Ryu's core fire fires a volley into the hangar and shoots one of Gotham's men. No! The look of grief and shock in Gotham's eyes. You can tell that he has a special camaraderie with his men. You have to feel for these Eon soldiers. They're put up against incredible odds of everything around them failing and resorting to the most physically demanding labor to get these supplies off the ship all the while trying to save their own lives. So what does Gotham do? He makes his personal Zaku 1 to manually push the Zakus out of the hangar. We've covered the Zaku 1 before in the video Top Gets Bopped, one of my Gundam Death Breakdowns. Check it out if you haven't. So Gotham is a one-man supply crew and he does as promised. He got the Zakus out of the Papua, along with the loads of supplies, just in time. His ship is shot one last time before crashing into the surface of Luna 2. Gotham did his part, so his mission should be over, right? WRONG! The Gundam, out of bazooka ammo, has its beam saber at the ready. Gotham catches sight of the Federation mobile suit and immediately moves to engage. Now, mind you, the Gundam has a beam saber. The Zaku-1 has nothing, no weapons. Shar tries to stop him, but this is personal for Gotham. After all, it was his ship that was destroyed, so he's taking it personally. He is convinced that his veteran experience with his Zaku will prove to be better than the Gundam. Gotham makes the boldest declaration in the One Year War. My Zaku and I have fought more battles together than you ever will. I'm not afraid of anybody. I'll show you how to destroy this piece of Federation trash with just one simple move, Commander Shar. Just one move? He's going out there to defeat the Gundam in one move? Again, no weapons, not even a Heat Hawk axe, 
just his shoulder. By the way, this is the iconic pose for the Zaku one. Amuro lunges with his beam saber, but Gundam surprisingly evades the strike and delivers a powerful shoulder charge into the Gundam's chest. But being this close while the Gundam has its beam saber, this was Gundam's fatal mistake. I really don't know what the guy was thinking. If he had a heat hawk axe, maybe this fight would be a little bit closer. Instead, he got one hit on the Gundam before his Zakord awkwardly inflated and exploded. Thank you, old school animation. So, got him. An honorable, loyal, and duty driven soldier of Xeon dies probably around September. 0079. Gotham's death wasn't in vain. His heroic actions of moving the Zakus out of the sinking Papua, they ended up getting Yashar's men, Fix and Matthew. It's unknown just how many of his men died while trying to do their resupplying duties. I personally think he did what he could do to honor his late friend. He really did all he could to deliver Xeon mobile suits. But despite Gotham's gallant efforts in the middle of battle, the two Zakus that he personally helped deliver were shot down in the very next episode. Congratulations, you made it to the end. The cringe is over. Unless you want more. Do it. Click those videos in the box. Do it. Do it.